I'm very sorry I have to say it, but I've got to say it. There are too many people who want all that Christ is, but their sin is well. I looked into the face of a young lady in our own church the other day. She's studying in one of the leading colleges of music. And she came to me utterly broken. This was the amazing thing about it, utterly broken. Tears pouring down her face, smashed under the power of the Spirit of God in a given meeting. And when I tried to counsel with her regarding this whole matter of going through with God and yielding everything to Him, there was a hesitancy, and I couldn't somehow figure it out. The more I pressed, the more I realized that there was some barrier here, and at last it came out. She said, I want to be all for Jesus Christ. I want to yield everything to Him. But I just don't know how to give up lying with my professor every night. And because she's caught up, hypnotized as it were, gripped by this thing in her life, she became to, came to the place where many Christians come, of rationalizing away the whole matter. She wanted everything that Christ was, and Lord of her life and all the rest of it, but only so long as she could continue in her sin. All we've been talking about this week and all we've been talking about this morning will get you nowhere unless you're prepared to make a choice today that you're going to be done with sin in your life in every form whatsoever. And that sin will have no place in my seeing or my speaking or my thinking or my working or my acting or my loving. Sin shall not reign in my mortal body. Will you make that choice? right here and now will you make that choice right here and now somebody has said the greatest problem of the church today is the invasion of materialism into our circles I'm going to say that a greater problem that I'm facing as a pastor of a church is this the curious the curious rationalization that has come into our thinking a kind of rationalization that explains everything away in order to do as I like. Are you prepared to dethrone sin in your life this morning? Are you prepared to dethrone sin in your life this morning? Don't talk about yielding. Unless that's your choice. This is my choice. God can't do this for me. This is my choice. I have to choose to dethrone sin. And I've come to see again and again from Genesis to Revelation in a way that's searching and searing my soul that God's far more interested in what I am than in what I do. And in fact, if what I am doesn't meet his holy requirements, what I do is worthless. What kind of a man are you? What kind of a woman are you? What is the measure of your dedication to this God with whom we have to do in Jesus Christ? It's one thing to be saved, and that's a good old-fashioned word, and don't dispute it. But I've discovered there's a great difference between being saved and being really surrendered. Now, what does this mean? What does that mean to you? When I look into the face of a young person who's been at least for a measure under the sound of the word, and there's no sense of obligation to give everything to Jesus Christ. I know they've never been to Calvary. What does Calvary mean to you? You see, love demands a response. If I appreciate the love of God in any measure whatsoever, I must reciprocate it at least to that same measure. Lord, I give thee everything. I keep back nothing for myself. Lord, I give thee everything. I keep back nothing for myself. The expectation of love. Your reasonable service. Have you given everything? I mean everything. I mean everything. Keeping back nothing for yourself. That's New Testament dedication. 
Anything less than that falls short of God's standard for your life. Never mind what you're doing. You may be in the most amazingly active church, the most amazingly active group, the most amazingly active team of laymen. But remember, God must be satisfied with what you are before he blesses what you do. Have you given everything? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, present your bodies. Look at that word, present, for a moment. In the original, it's a word which means the handing over of a gift. You never give a gift to take it back again. You bring your life. You say, here it is, Lord, I hand it over. I can't take it back again. Why is there emphasis on the body here? Why? Because the body is that through which we express God's will while we're here upon earth. God has no eyes but your eyes, my friend. God has no ears but your ears. God has no tongue but your tongue. God has no hands but your hands. God has no feet but your feet within the world in which you move. God, again, lives in us through our eyes, our lips, our minds, our hands, our feet, our bodies, radiating out his glory and power and grace. And he wants your body. He can't do it without your body. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ as believers, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ as believers, and I'm not talking about the throne us, the great white throne, I'm talking about the bema, the judgment seat of Christ, for all believers, barring none. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and your eschatological views do not change us at all, whatever interpretation you may put on prophecy will find you one day at the judgment seat of Christ. I want to remind you from 2 Corinthians 5 that we're going to be judged for the things done in the body. Our past, our present is going to be reviewed at the judgment seat of Christ in terms of what we have done in the body. That body of yours is God's. I'll tell you every part of it is God's. He's bought you outright through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. And until you place that body in all its totality on the altar of God's acceptance, my friend, you're not a dedicated man. You're not a dedicated woman. Because I want to tell you something. The Bible teaches so specifically within the Old Testament and New that God never consecrates a part, He always consecrates the whole. He never consecrates a part, He always consecrates the whole. And until I put my total life on the altar, He will not totally consecrate me. The total man! Speaking of His total dedication and therefore His total consecration. You can't consecrate your life, that's bad theology. You dedicate your life. What you dedicate, God consecrates. And God only consecrates what you dedicate. And God never consecrates a part. He only consecrates the whole. Therefore, your dedication must be total. Have you yielded everything? And Paul says, how can you who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Absolutes are absolutes. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior and you've been identified with Him in death upon the cross and you've seen Jesus not only dying for you but you've seen yourself dead with Christ, then your whole life is terminated. You're finished with it and you can't have anything more to do with it. Your life now is entirely alive to God. That's the life I want you to yield to me. But personally, have you been crucified? Are you asking the Holy Spirit daily to apply the killing power, the mortifying power, the crucifying power of the cross to your self-life according to Romans 8, 13, in order that the Christ life, the life, may break through that mortal body of yours and you can yield that kind of life to God and say, that's the kind of life, O oh God, I bring you to use day by day in total surrender. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. I don't care how popular it is. I don't care how attractive. I don't care what good jokes it can tell. I don't care what theology it can preach. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, I can't kill my self-life. I can't. You can't. 
But if you submit it to the indwelling spirit to apply the killing power of the cross, the sentence of the cross to that emerging self-life within you, if you're trusting the Holy Spirit to do that, the Bible says, if ye through the spirit to mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Now, the whole sacrifice is on the altar. Very well. Can't the priest leave it now? Isn't his job complete? No! That's where we make our mistake. No. No. The priest has to stay there and watch it as a continual sacrifice, as it was often called, or a burning sacrifice, until it was wholly consumed. And there were times when these big sacrifices tended to slip from off the altar. And you know that God even made provision for that and told Moses to tell Aaron that certain instruments had to be employed at that altar. They were called flesh hooks. Flesh hooks. And these flesh hooks were handy. When that sacrifice tended to slip any place, those flesh hooks were applied and that sacrifice was brought back to the center of the altar, center of the altar, center of the flame, until it was wholly consumed. Now, what does that mean to you and me? Determination, not desire, controls our destiny. There are thousands of Christians, and hundreds of them here tonight, who desire to be totally dedicated to God. But are you determined? You'll never stay in the place of total dedication until the flesh hook of determination is put into that life of yours. To be right where God wants you, the center of the flame. What is the other flesh hook? I call it discipline. You say, what's discipline? I mean discipline. It's the word we don't like. But nobody can be a disciple without being disciplined. Are you disciplined in your quiet time? Do you rise every day to meet your God? I wonder how many businessmen here get up and they just say a brief little prayer at the bed and to breakfast and away to work. And this goes on week after week, month after month, year after year, and you expect to be used by God. Efficiency, but no effectiveness. You say, well, how can I have my quiet time? Everything seems to break in upon it. The children, the telephone, the business needs. I'll tell you one word, discipline, discipline, discipline. And a man who's not disciplined is not dedicated. For part of my dedication is determination and discipline, the flesh hooks that keep me at the place of yieldedness to God. God won't make me yield against my will. If my dedication is real, I'm going to back it up by determination and discipline. A living sacrifice. Girl came to me some while ago and said, Stephen Olford, this business of dedication just doesn't work. I stood up in convention and conference and retreat time and time again, and somehow it never works. I said, if I understand Romans 12, 1 and 2, when I lay my life upon that altar, it's not for a week's trial or a month's trial or a year's trial to see whether or not this thing works out. When I lay my life upon that altar with intelligence, knowing what God has done for me, then that life is on there forever. What are you doing off the altar? Dedication. 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 Do you know what holy means? It means holy. Sanctified. Pure. Most of us can be saints in church and demons at home. A pleasing sacrifice. How are you when your door is closed? In your library, in your study, in your office? A pleasing sacrifice. A pleasing sacrifice. Seen or unseen, still going up. A pleasing sacrifice. That's the price to pay. Dedication. But what God needs not only in the pulpit, but in the pew are men and women whose lives are so totally and completely dedicated that they fulfill the divine obligation, the divine order, the divine objective of this surrender, this surrender. 
I want to ask as we close tonight. You're saved. But are you surrendered? 